Hi everyone, this is your host, Zifa Suela. Welcome to Qudwa's podcast powered by the CFA Society Bahrain. At Qudwa, we believe in the philosophy of paying it forward. This is why we are recreating our conversations that we have with people we look up to. We would like to take this time to thank Ahli United Bank in continuously supporting us in our initiatives. Today we are going to be talking about mentorship and its importance. Joining us today is Mark Hurst, Deputy CEO in Private Banking and Wealth Management in Ahli United Bank, Bahrain. Mark has over 35 years of experience in the banking industry with previous experience in Standard Chartered, Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank. He is also a Chartered Fellow of the Institute of Directors, member of the CFA Institute and STEP. Welcome, Mark. It's so good to speak to you again. Oh, welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. You too, Mark. There's a great deal of research that shows the power of mentoring and how effective it is. So why would anyone need a mentor in their life or their career? I think when you look at mentorship, you have to think of it in a different perspective from coaching of individuals or how you lead individuals in your own staff. Mentoring is much more about improving a person in them in their own light, their own status in terms of the things that they do, emphasizing the good things. It's not a coaching session. It is more a helping them improve and exaggerate the things that they do better going forward. And that's why I think it's an important part of the types of things that you need to encourage people so they have a good understanding about where their uh, areas that they can improve and areas that they need to still work on going forward. You know, I do agree in terms of guiding them because when you have a mentor, people do work and perform better in terms of their career, especially in balancing the the work and non-work life. It's a two-way relationship after all. I do believe that mentors can benefit a lot from their mentees, especially when there's a generation generational gap going on here. Absolutely. I think that both sides can learn something from this experience, and I think it becomes a rich experience between both parties. And as you mentioned, there could be generational, there could also be differences in perspective in terms of background as well. And I think that's also different in terms of perspectives. You know, coming from a Anglo-Saxon background and having to mentor someone in the Middle East has a different perspective and also a female in the Middle East or other aspects. So I think everyone can benefit from these things. And as you mentioned, sometimes these things are not necessarily work-related. They can also be to do with social interactions, stress levels, how do you cope with those types of things. Everyone has stresses in their life. And especially as you're developing your career, you're more likely to have high stress levels as you become anxious and other aspects This is not something that other people haven't coped with and your mentor should be able to provide the mentee with some guidance about how he or she can cope with those things going forward. And that's why I think it's a valuable experience together. It's not just a one way, as you mentioned before, it's both ways that um, both people can benefit from that. You've touched based on some of the attributes that good mentors have, but what could other attributes be that could differentiate them as well? In other words, what differentiates a good mentor from a bad one? I think one of the key things is that you have to be a good listener. You have to observe people and listen to them and listen to not only what they're saying but also what their body language is and understand where they're coming in their perspective. So being open and engaged and to also be vulnerable as a a mentor to those opportunities in terms of the things, because we're all human beings. We've made mistakes in our career in the past, and one of the good things about being a mentor that is of a older generation, you can kind of recognize that you've made some mistakes in the past, but you've overcome them. And I think sharing those things is important for people to see that despite whatever is happening in their lives, that they can overcome and still succeed going forward. And I think it's that two-way conversation that is important and makes a difference between someone who is a good mentor or a not so good mentor. I don't want to use the word bad, but I mean, I think everyone has something to give. I think the other thing that a good mentor will do, it's more about how you uh, position things as opposed to indicating these are areas that you need to improve on in terms of discipline, because that's, as I say, much more coaching and that's what you should expect from your line manager. That's not necessarily what a good mentor should do. And also, I think a good mentor expands your perspective, takes you into new areas. Have you thought about these types of things? And also, in terms of new social networking connections, 
and also explores with you where you feel as if your most challenging areas are, where your vulnerabilities are, and where you think that you could improve more. And that becomes a, a good uh, relationship to have because it's secure, because there is no uh, boss uh, employee relationship is about sharing thoughts and ideas and to explore those things and to have a different perspective in things. Often with people as well, I think it's sometimes good to find a common ground. So often you, I will share with people certain books or certain articles that I think are interesting that bring a different perspective through the conversation because then that allows the mentor and the mentee to have something common that they have uh, beyond there. And it's a uh, conversation point between them two. I mean, they have to be thoughtful and you have to give some thought to those things and that's and it's on the same basis on both ways. Uh, Mark, you mentioned a point here where one of your colleagues in your previous job said that you were too ambitious when this trait isn't actually a negative trait for it to be pointed out in that light. But they denoted it in a very bad way. How did you cope with that? I shared with you, I think, when we first talked about this, you know, one of the things that I found very difficult in, early on in my career, and uh, you missed one place that I worked for was Royal Bank of Canada, where I was the chief investment officer. And my boss at the time told me at the end of the day, and I said, well, you know, how am I going to progress in terms of my career? And he said that, that you're too ambitious. You want to get forward and move forward too quickly. I found that extremely difficult as an individual to cope with because I thought, well, what, what am I, should I not be so ambitious? Should I uh, not uh, turn up on time? Should I look, uh, respond slowly to things? And these didn't feel right with me. And I struggled for almost a year and a half uh, in terms of those things. And I think that that was difficult for me. I'll share something else with you as well. You know, during my time um, at Royal Bank of Canada, I went through a divorce. And it was a, a easy uh, divorce as those things can happen. We still have a good relationship with my ex-wife and my older children. But I refused to tell anyone at work that this was happening because I saw that as a massive social demo demotion. And it was only when I joined the Deutsche Bank that I actually decided I have to stop this. I have to move on and I have to tell people. And it was a very difficult thing to reconcile because you have a persona at work that carries a certain piece and yet you want to share those parts when you're experiencing something difficult at work. Now, if I had had a mentor at that time, I'm sure I wouldn't have spent close to three to four years bottling this thing up with regard to my relationship with my ex-wife and be able to move forward. And I think a Deutsche Bank allowed me to bring that clean break and move forward. But I think these are the types of things that everyone goes through. I mean, maybe divorce is extreme, but everyone has challenges, be it at home or at work or with other colleagues. And I think you have to be able to share that with someone and see a path forward in terms of the things you can do. As I say, I, I really didn't cope very well with it. I wrestled myself because I didn't know what to, you know, how I was meant to act at work, at meetings. I started to withdraw myself in meetings because I felt, okay, if I'm the first one answering the questions, then people are going to see me as being too assertive, aggressive, so then I withdrew. I would always be the, the third or first person putting up the suggestions, even if I knew the, some of the answers, just because I thought, okay, people are judging me and I need to take a step back. So it took me a long time to cope with that in terms of those times. And the other thing is, is that I struggle with was... Uh, and we'll come on and talk about this as well, is that I, I struggle with other people that I thought were more aggressive or assertive at work and thinking, how are they succeeding and I'm being told that I should be taking a step back? And these are kind of, how do you deal with these sort of dichotomy between these two things? People are being successful because they're being assertive and aggressive and yet my boss, who is the more senior person, saying, look, you know, you need to, take a step back. Maybe people thought I was a threat to them and maybe that was part of the issue I had to cope with. But it takes time. And I think that's how, if you have a good mentor, you can build that into the conversation and understand what's going on. I've read a recent study that showed a severe supply and demand imbalance in obtaining a mentor. Now, while there is a huge fraction of people going out there to find a mentor, 
there is an issue lying in the fact that there is only a small fraction of mentor seekers finding a mentor actually. I also noticed that people don't know where to find a mentor when they're stuck at home or they don't have any connections to find a mentor or they could be too shy to approach someone to ask for advice. What can they do right now to establish a relationship? Everyone both has to, you know, in this uh, relationship between mentee and mentor, both have to feel as if they're getting something out of it. So I think that has to be part of it. Part the, the mentee has to believe that there is some value in terms of what they're going to learn from the person that they're mentoring with. And I think you need to think about those. Now, you can think in a small circle. It doesn't have to be in a business environment. To be able to share some of your anxiety and concerns and as you grow as an individual, can be within a, a broader family environment. It doesn't have to be in a, always in a work environment. Someone who's an experienced business person elsewhere, they will bring a different perspective to the relationship that you have at work. And it doesn't always have to be in your own industry so that you don't feel as if it's you're threatening in that kind of way. And some of those things are important in terms of how you think about how you develop because at the end of the day, you're on a path in financial services like I was for many years. And then you start to explore that some of the challenges exist in the logistics field or in retail and other areas of industry. They're all experiencing very similar challenges. How do you overcome those types of things? And these are, so I think it's much more your own mindset that you start to think, okay, I need to find someone who is from a financial services background or that has that type of, it doesn't need to be that way. It can be someone who's a successful business person someone who's led a team to do something else, maybe to some form of competitive uh, sport or something else, uh, achieved a great deal in terms of the, their personal achievements, overcome some difficulties. And I think we can all learn from a number of those different sources. And as, as you mentioned, because we're all locked down, I think we have to be creative now about the types of people that we would interact with and get feedback from. I also want to add to that that I really do believe that you shouldn't have one mentor in your life or one mentor for your whole career. So, for example, there are people that I really look up to in terms of public speaking. There are people who are so good at money management or someone who's good at people's management as well. Absolutely. I think that there are different aspects of these things that you can look for and they, they'll come at different moments and you'll find strength from that mentorship that you had as it relates to your health aspects, as it relates to fund management, as it relates to whatever the other aspects are. And I think it's getting that balance right with your overall mentor relationships. And I think everyone needs, as I said, feel getting some value out of it. That's why you share your experiences with that person. They share something back. And there's a two-way experience in terms of something that is rich and enlightens both. And as I said at the beginning, something that moves you forward as an individual and that should be your objective have I developed and learned something new that benefits me maybe not immediately I think that's the other thing is that we all nowadays want immediate feedback and immediate satisfaction of all these things back at our program at Qudwa we pair up CFA members and candidates we've experienced many successful relationships but we've also experienced some failed relationships there uh, one of the reasons that we noticed behind those failures was that either that the mentee was not too invested in his or her, her self-development or that the mentor didn't have time to commit to this relationship. But we also came across people who showed keenness to mentoring someone, but they just didn't know exactly how to give back to them. They didn't have that skill. So what's your advice to anyone who's trying to be a better mentor? I think you have, to, you have to be at a certain stage where you want to give something back to some individual, right? Not necessarily related in your own team and how you see it's a future and how someone develops. So I think that it has to start with that core of a person that that's something that they want to do, something that they want to give back to a broader range of individuals. And someone who feels that, uh, you know, their, their, their future success of their mentee is how they're going to judge whether that's worked well. And that success doesn't necessarily mean to be promotion, but they're a more rounded person, they're more balanced, they're a happier individual, they're less anxious, all those other aspects. It isn't always one directional, and I think we also have to keep that perspective as well. 
The other thing is I think that you have to devote the time and you have to agree with your mentee what, what it is that you're going to agree to between the two parties and where, where there are limits in terms of the things. And I think that sort of plan that you need to agree with is important at the beginning of the relationship. This is what I can devote to you on a regular basis. On an ad hoc basis, I can do the following things, depending on what the circumstances. We can all find time. It's a matter of how do we pitch that time between those things and how much people need. And as you mentioned before, now with the changing environment, to be able to have a WhatsApp call for 20 minutes with someone who is your mentee, who's going through an anxious experience either at home or at work or in other aspects, it's easy to deal with those things. And then to come back at the regular meeting to discuss how they cope with it on an ongoing basis and why did they get themselves into that position, I think it's about making sure you do devote the time. Uh, you know, there's always reasons why you can't do things, but to have that short interface and for the mentee to know that there is a connection that they can reach out to and connect with and get advice. They may not always want that advice, but it gives a different perspective in terms of the things you need. So I think you have to agree a plan, how you're going to interact with each other and how you can uh, move forward in terms of those periods. But I think as well, if there is a period where, you, as I say, it's a mutually beneficial, if you feel, you feel you're not getting what you need and the mentor feels then you have to say, okay, this isn't working for both parties and you have to move on. And I think that will be sad, but I think you need to move to the next mentor. I've heard someone who previously mentored before mention that one of the most awkward moments is when they reach towards the end of the mentorship phase. How do you gradually move on? I think the thing is, is that you can see people in different phases of their careers and their lives and what they want to try and do. And I think that you just want to scan. It's that honest conversation to say, this is what I'm prepared to commit to, you're prepared to commit to. That doesn't mean you disconnect with everyone and people can reach out at you know, periods of time for a long period they don't know, but you knew where they were developing. And you, it's a bit like a, you know, sometimes I think, you know, we have our parents and we talk to our parents and essentially they're the greatest mentors that we will ever have, right? And uh, so they give us guidance about many things, multiple aspects, how we relate to our siblings, how do we relate to our peers and other things. And I think that basically this is a parent uh, that relates to the business world that sometimes our parents had no insight into. And I think that helps, you know, the mentee. I mean, if you, if you don't have a... Uh, mother or father that's a banker, uh, then, you know, they struggle with sometimes the types of uh, anxiety or, you know, in their age when they were growing up, maybe uh, the types of things that we expect now in terms of the social norms that we expect, particularly around equality and those aspects, was never accepted in the past, but now it is accepted. So therefore, it's a new dimension that they're not easy to guide you through. And I think that's where the mentor comes in, in that sort of sense. What do you think about adding the concept of accountability to mentorship? I think it's good that you have some, as I said, you have some sort of overall plan. But I, I, I come back to what I said before. This is not a coaching session. This is not, a, you know, I need you to do the following things. This is about more guidance and how you get that balance right. Because, you know, there is a coach, there is trainers, there is your boss in, in your work line will give those type of directions. But I think the thing is, is that a mentor gives you, okay, I'm struggling with my boss. He irritates me or she irritates me in the following things. How do I cope with that type of person? Some of the people that I've mentored in the past that, you know, I always try and focus because everyone wants to talk about the things that they're good at. Now let's also talk about the things that you struggle with. I struggle with dealing with people with this type of background, right? You know, how do I cope with those types of things? How am I meant to be seen? Am I seen amongst my peers very well, but the back office staff don't deal with me very well. So I need to work on how do I, because if I want to be an overall leader of a business, I have to carry both sides of this equation together. So what am I going to do to try and get more familiar or more empathy with those types of individuals that are maybe not the normal things? Your boss will be less interested in that because he's interested in your peers and your your performance. performance and those types of things. But if you want to, if you see as yourself as a leader of the future, then this is also important that, you know, 
how do I deal with the secretaries, how do I deal with the operations staff, all those types of things, my interactions with different areas. I struggle with that, you know. And I think the mentor can give you that perspective to sort of say, okay, let's talk about how, why you find that difficult, what can we do about it, and how can we improve those things. And then they become small little steps that you do, you know, to improve those things with the long-term goal that you you want to lead the enterprise overall. And everyone says, everyone, not just the five or six people that you're leading, everyone says, she's the person to lead our future. And I think that's where people want to, to get to. Mark, I like how you said she is going to be the next leader, because this brings me to what I was about to mention to you and fits perfectly here. When I first spoke to you, one of the things that I first noticed about you was your advocacy towards women empowerment in the workplace, which is honestly one of the things that I really admire about you. And we see a lot of advancements in this aspect to, in this region. But I still believe that women and minorities lack benefit of sponsorship in the workplace as opposed to their male counterparts. So how can mentors especially those in the workplace, transition from just guiding their mentees to actually sponsoring and advocating diverse talents behind closed doors? That's a very broad question, and but the right one to ask. You know, one of the things that I mentioned before when I struggled uh, with the ambition uh, in the Royal Bank of Canada uh, that I was told in feedback, and one of the things that I really struggled with was very ambitious females. And I wanted to really understand what did that mean because they were more aggressive than I were and achieving more in terms of oh and yeah I was being pulled back. And then I started to discover that you know if you, you're in an organisation long enough, some of those females fell away very quickly. They clashed with someone, and all of a sudden they were gone. And in finance industry, there's a very poor track record with regard to female leaders in our industry. And yes, we have a few now. They new CEO of Citibank and a few others, but in general, it's quite male-dominated. So I wanted to really try and understand and sort of that reflection back to myself is to sort of say, uh, you know, why is that? And I did my master's degree, my dissertation was on uh, the, the styles of leadership of late females and also people from minority groups, because that's also another area that is not well representative in leaderships. And I tried to explore that. And then you will start to realize that males in general, I'm very exaggerating here in the sense of we're oversimplifying, lead in a certain kind of way. It's very much a carrot and stick uh, type of uh, relationship. You do something for me and I'll do something for you in terms of that relationship. Women in general, if they're good leaders, lead in a much more holistic way. And actually what I would argue is it's a much more rounded leadership style. And I learned much more from that in the sense of how can you actually encourage, because there is a huge benefit when you try and bring an organization forward that, as I say, everyone is behind you and working in one team. If you have factions that, you know, I'll, do, I'll, I'll give you a reward if you deliver this type of uh, performance, then that alienates another side of the organization that didn't get that performance. So women have a fantastic... And I've tried to learn from that about how you include more people in terms of decision making and move the conversation forward. And if you think about it uh, in a family, and someone who taught me this uh, in the US when I was there is that when you think about the, a family, uh, it's generally speaking the mother of the family that holds people together. And I don't mean that there isn't a uh, patriarch in the sense of overall, but in general, it's the mother that is the center. And the reason is, is because when you have a conflict with your cousin or your brother or your sister, it's usually your mother that tells you, you must see the other perspective or why they're arguing with you. Your father is generally speaking, and that's always generalization, is, you know, he's the person who shouts and tells you and gets you back in line. And you need those things at certain periods of time. But generally speaking, it's your mother that brings you a richer understanding about how interrelationships in a family work. And I think that if we as organizations, we embrace more women, understand the kind of um, uh, style of leadership that they will provide, we'd be a stronger uh, organization in terms of the types of things. Now, why um, 
there's lots of reasons uh, why we don't experience many female leaders in terms of organizations, some of which I think we all know about in terms of uh, wanting children and other aspects. But I think that's always a, a negative look in the sense of, I think that they're not encouraged to develop and be themselves. What they look at is I want to be more like a male, male leader, a carrot and stick leader, as opposed to a female leader. And there's a very uh, good article in the Harvard Business Review about the ways women lead. And this really is transformational uh, in the sense of comparing how men lead and how women lead. And I think that's really where is the block, actually. The block is really in, in, in the males, in the sense of we expect certain leaders to behave in certain ways. Females start to perform like that because they think that's the way they're going to get forward and they lose some of what they're good at doing in terms of bringing people forward. And I think if we just broaden out our mind and recognize that not everyone is going to lead a team in the same kind of way, then that's the way forward. And that applies to minorities, that applies to other areas as well. It doesn't just apply to females. You have to recognize that if that person is a good leader, then they will deliver the results over time and they don't necessarily need to use the same uh, facets of leadership that men often exhibit. I think it's a long-term game. And you know, you know, if, you, if you're in for the long run, then you will have that kind of leadership style because you, knew, and you recognize the importance of every part of the organization to contribute to the overall success. Does it happen instantly overnight? And the command and control type of uh, carrot and stick has an impact in the short term, but is it moving the organization forward holistically together? And I think that that's where the challenge lies in terms of the things we do. If you like this episode, please don't forget to subscribe and share this with your friends. We'll see you guys soon.